Hello and welcome to uh, the Brand Gym webinar on Making Purpose Pay. Thank you uh, for joining. I am David Nichols, and I'm going to be hosting this uh, for the next hour. Uh, I head up our innovation and pharmaceutical practices. Um, and the plan that we have for today is one hour with 40 minutes for presentation and then hopefully 15 to 20 for Q&A. Um, now, you can ask questions to be answered by using the Q&A icon down here and we'll get to those at the end or any kind of general chat can be put in the chat uh, facility as usual. Um, so I'd now like to introduce our two speakers, uh, the first of which is David Taylor. Hello, greetings. So uh, David is the founder and uh, group managing partner of The Brand Gym and also leads our online training platform, The Brand Gym Academy. Uh, he's led brand purpose projects for many major brands, including Costa, Vodafone, Pladis, WD40 and so forth. Um, he is also the author of our seven best-selling branding books. Our second uh, speaker today is John Goldstone. Hi, everyone. John uh, joined the brand gym in 2016 after 25 years uh, career in great businesses like PepsiCo and Unilever. He is a fellow of the Marketing Society and uh, heads up our brand rejuvenation practice, working with clients such as Jay Smuckers, Indeed, Philips, uh, ABF and Britvic. So uh, I will now hand over to uh, David Taylor to uh, take it from here. So welcome everyone to the Brand Gym uh, webinar. Uh, just to give you a little bit of information about the actual research we're going to be sharing today, we talked to over 180 marketing directors from around the world covering different sectors, different regions, and we complemented that with a consumer survey, talking to 600 consumers in the UK and India. And this research project was complemented by learning from our global brand gene team, working on projects across the globe for clients as diverse as Unilever, LVMH, ITV, Castrol, and Vodafone. And before we dive into the actual real findings from the research, just want to set a bit of context and look at the rise of brand purpose. Now, brand purpose is clearly a hot topic the research shows that 77% of marketing directors surveyed said that brand purpose had become more important in the last one to two years and 21% said no change. So this is clearly a topic which is at the forefront of the minds of many marketing teams. And you can see why our survey showed three key benefits that brand purpose can in principle deliver for an organization. It can help create alignment. So one marketing director said, it's the North Star guiding customers, employees, and stakeholders in the same direction. It can create consistency. So another CMO said, it's paramount to have a clear purpose to deliver a consistent message across what is an increasingly large number of different communication channels. And it can also deliver distinctiveness. With increasing competition, brand purpose is even more important in order to win. But despite um, all of those um, benefits, it's really interesting that when we surveyed our 180 marketing director, um, only 50% of them said that brand purpose was effective at inspiring and, and guiding growth. So at least 50% of people really not sure about whether brand purpose is actually driving uh, growth. And that disconnect, if you like, between purpose and profit has certainly led to some pretty high profile casualties. So the picture on the left there is Emmanuel uh, Faber, who used to be chief executive of Danone until quite recently. Um, his whole strategy was very kind of purpose driven. Um, and it really led to, to him being ousted from uh, Danone. 
as uh, purpose, you know, failed to convert into profit. Um, even Alan Jope at um, Unilever, I saw an article in Financial Times last week, is starting to be under a little bit of pressure at the moment. Um, and I thought this quote from, from Sean Gogarty, who I used to work with at uh, Unilever, kind of hits the nail on the head, really. So he said, purpose that doesn't pay is charity by uh, another name. Um, and this is not a business strategy. So picking up on those challenges that John has highlighted there around purpose not always delivering uh, and some very high leaders paying the price for that, we want to share with you today five workouts to help you make purpose pay. Now, these workouts are part of the Brand Growth Programme. David mentioned earlier on the Brand Gym Academy. So the Mastering Brand Growth Programme kicks off actually just over three weeks' time. And Brand Purpose is a key part of that programme. And if you stick around to the end, uh, you will get an exclusive uh, offer for workshop attendees relating to that uh, programme. So stick around to the end. Now, the first of these five workouts... Uh, is a subject close to my heart as an ex PNG marketeer, and it's about rooting purpose in your product. Now, sustainability is, is clearly an important part of brand purpose. Two thirds of consumers say they're ready to pay more to companies committed to positive social and environmental impact. So it's important from a consumer standpoint. It's also important in terms of employees. So 51% of students and college degree workers said that social purpose was an essential or very important part of their ideal job. So sustainability is clearly an important part of brand purpose. But what our research flags up is the risk of sustainability leading companies to ladder up, so to climb up the brand ladder to an emotional territory where the brand lacks a legitimate connection. And Tom Fishburne, the marketoonist, who is fantastic at bringing to life these sorts of issues, has this great cartoon you may have seen about laddering, where a salty snack brand uh, ladders up from, you know, salty and crunchy through sharing right up to world peace, and the brand manager says, can't we go higher? So this is a real issue that we see coming through in our research about losing touch with business reality. Uh, an example of that that we saw and we wrote a blog about is in the world of beer, which is a world that I, I know and, and enjoy. Estrella Dam, uh, saving the ocean, which is an incredibly worthy uh, you know, objective. But you watch the film, Another Way of Living, uh, there's an underwater slow-mo ballet dancer there's some sort of white, is that a plastic bag? Maybe, I'm not quite sure. It's all a little bit obscure, and it leaves you wondering, what does it have to do with Estrella Dam and beer? Where's the, where's the linkage between the brand and the sustainability platform that they're doing as part of their brand purpose? And our marketing director said that this is a, an issue because 69% of them said that brand purpose should focus on both core product and sustainability, and a further 21% even said it should focus on product alone. So that's a total of 90% of marketing directors saying product should play a key role in your brand purpose. And in fact, one great quote, a brand does not have to focus on social issues or saving the planet to have a purpose. And I think this is an issue which you see a lot in the marketing press where people are interchangeably using brand purpose and sustainability. Now, the consumer survey I talked about earlier shows that consumers are even more interested in product. When we talk to them about the factors driving brand choice, 52%, just over half, said it's all about the product, and a further 38% said product and sustainability, and only 10% said sustainability alone. So here we have the same proportion, 90%, telling us that product is key, and an even bigger proportion, 17 points higher than what marketing directors think, talking about the fact that product alone is what drives purchase. So really important, the first thing that we would invite you to think about when you're working on brand purpose is that it should be inspiring the product, not just people and planet and sustainability. 
A nice example from John's uh, old uh, em employer, Unilever, uh, the Hellman's brand, which is one that I worked on globally. The purpose is to help people enjoy the simple pleasure of good, honest food without worry or waste. Now, what I like about this is that it does inspire product ideas. So, for example, here, real summer flavours. Nice, simple flavours that are all about enjoying nice summer food, like burgers, for example. So it's inspiring the product side of Hellman's. It also does inspire their sustainability platform, which is to make taste, not waste. Now, the reason I love this sustainability idea is that it's also rooted in the product because Hellman's is encouraging people to take those leftovers that would normally be thrown in the bin and turn them into nice, tasty food using Hellman's mayonnaise and sauces. So they're doing their little bit to work on the planet, but they're also incorporating the product and therefore promoting the brand and therefore delivering the ultimate objective of all marketing, which is the SMS, sell more stuff, drive sales and drive profit. And this leads us to the definition of purpose that we'd like to share with you and invite you to consider, which is the distinctive role a brand plays in improving everyday life that inspires business growth, rooting it in growth to avoid that problem that John talked about earlier about purpose not paying its way. So you see here product on the one hand, people and planet on the other, driving down to profit, which is the long term goal. Great. Thanks, David. Um, so, yeah, this takes us on to me talking about what, what we call the sustainability um, spectrum. Um, if you could just move on one. I, I think when you, when you first think about um, brand purpose, you know, if you're working on a brand and you're trying to define your purpose, the brands that come to mind are brands like, um, you know, Patagonia or um, Ben and & Jerry's. Um, and we'd call those kind of activist brands, essentially. I mean, the vast majority of their communication is based around sustainability, either environmental or, or, or social. But actually, for the vast majority of brands, you know, that, that's, just not, that's just not right. You know, you don't really have the license to, to do that. And I think the smart brands um, do a really good job of picking their spot on that sustainability um, spectrum. So the first kind of route in, if you like, is as a activist brand like Ben and & Jerry's, and this is a Ben & Jerry's uh, case study. So their purpose is, you know, very nice and, and inspiring. So to make the finest euphoric concoctions with wholesome natural ingredients and business practices that respect the earth and the environment. And that purpose basically leads into two types of communication. Um, the first of those is around um, campaigning, or as we sometimes call it, brand storytelling. So an example here would be um, at the bottom left there, um, Ben and Jerry's as a brand, you know, picking a fight um, with uh, Priti Patel, who's the UK uh, Home Secretary, um, around uh, refugees. And on the other side, um, the brand, um, you know, is good at kind of balancing that off with what we call um, brand um, uh, story doing. So real tangible actions. So again, examples here are moving towards uh, cleaner, more environmentally friendly uh, freezers. Um, and then for example, the support for Greystone uh, Bakery. So these are the guys that make the, the little fudge brownies that go into Ben and Jerry's and also support um, low income families in um, uh, the New York um, area. And of course, for Ben and Jerry's, you know, it's been a pretty successful um, uh, strategy for them. So since Unilever acquired the brand over 20 years ago, sales have more than doubled to $1.2 billion. So that's route one. Route two is what we call um, um, sort of uh, uh, leading. So this is where um, sustainability is a kind of a, a leading part of your communication. Again, Lifebuoy, another Unilever brand, is, is a really nice, nice example. So their purpose is to create accessible hygiene products and promote healthy hygiene habits. And actually, their hand-washing program is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's, over time, helped over a billion people improve their hand-washing hygiene um, and ultimately 
um, you know, stopped uh, young children um, dying. Um, but that's not the only thing they do. For example, when Lifebuoy recently launched um, in the UK at the beginning of the, the COVID crisis, um, it was a very pragmatic campaign talking about them as being you know, the number one global uh, soap brand. Um, I suspect they use the sustainability angle a little bit more with retail customers, but for the consumer, it was quite a pragmatic uh, message that they, that they put out. And then our final route, route three, is where um, sustainability is more of a support for the brand. Um, so this example is, is Heinz. So Heinz actually have a much broader um, um, sort of all encompassing purpose. So to make life delicious, um, sparking joy and bringing people together. Um, and then this um, 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 purpose-based um, activity um, that we've highlighted is called Silence the Rumble, which was a partnership with a charity called The Magic Breakfast. Um, and it was all about um, giving um, deprived um, kids a kind of a fairly nutritious um, start uh, to the day. So this is basically just a summary of, of those uh, three types of sustainability um, approach. So, you know, as you start to define your own brand purpose, think about, you know, do you want to be an activist like Ben and Jerry's? Do you want um, sustainability to take a leading role like it does for uh, Lifebuoy? Um, or do you want sustainability to take more of a um, supporting role uh, like it does for Heinz? And then just to sort of finish off on that, I think a, a, an issue which sometimes needs clarification is the bits that John's talked through there being the product brand roles, activist leading or supporting, but then underpinned by sometimes corporate social respons responsibility happening at a corporate level. So there are things to do with, for example, environmental uh, sourcing, CO2 production, you know, diversity. There are other very important issues um, you know, which, which may be actually happening at a corporate level, which underpins the product uh, brand activity. And Unilever is a very good example where you can see that, uh, see that happening. So part of the tension and I think challenge for teams at a very senior level is figuring out what's going to happen at a product brand level. So what's going to happen at the Bear and Jerry's or the Lifebuoy level, and then what's going to happen at the corporate level as a company as a whole benefiting the portfolio of, of brands. That's an interesting question to, 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 that we have to grapple with sometimes on projects. Great, thanks, David. So yeah, so once you've um, defined your, um, your your brand purpose, you know, of course, the secret is to leverage it to drive uh, growth. Um, so when we surveyed our um, marketing um, directors, we just asked them a very simple question. So what do you believe um, are the greatest drivers of, of growth for brand uh, purpose? And actually, the, the highest scoring answer, as you can see there, is this um, um, belief that if you deliver brand purpose you know, through the whole business, then that um, sets you up for the best chance of driving uh, business growth. So um, I thought um, the next example, which is, which is Lego, is obviously a, a, a brand that does a really good job of um, articulating its brand purpose through everything that it does, you know, all parts of the business, um, all uh, consumer touch points. So its um, uh, brand purpose is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow, which is, which is really nicely kind of stated and, and inspired by this kind of um, belief they have that, that kids should be, are the role models for the, for the rest of us. You know, if you develop this generation of builders, that can only be good um, for, for everyone. So that purpose, if you like, turns up everywhere uh, within within the Lego uh, business. Um, I don't know how up to speed you are with their kind of latest product developments, but around their core product, um, they've introduced um, gaming functionality, which is this uh, example that's shown here. They've also introduced uh, products which feature um, artificial intelligence, um, uh, products which feature robotics, you know, amazing um, innovation, very much linked back to that purpose. They've also, again, you know, you'll be familiar with it, stretched the brand into, into films, so into, into movies, with a very sort of clearly stated um, ambition of using that to extend their brand reach and therefore to recruit more um, uh, builders of tomorrow um, into the brand. 
Next part is around um, uh, recruitment. So then bringing people into the business. Um, if you ever have an interview at Lego, um, a face-to-face -face one, uh, if you remember those, um, you'll basically be given a pile of Lego and asked to use your imagination, which is, which is pretty cool. And then finally, um, of course, you know, they have a very active um, uh, social um, action program. So for example, they run uh, play days um, all around the world, um, which give um, lower income kind of deprived um, households access to products and experiences that they might not otherwise be able to afford. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we're going to come back to Lego uh, in a bit more detail towards the end of the, uh, the presentation. Uh, the, 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 the build on what, what you've heard from John is the reason I think that, that purpose works so well is uh, I love the way that it works, uh, you know, inter internally as well ex as externally. So, you know, as, as John talked about there, the recruitment exercise, we're looking for builders. Um, so making sure you have that alignment, you know, be between your external proposition and your internal uh, proposition, I think is really powerful. So just to sum up where we've got to, we, 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 we talked about the growing importance of brand purpose at the beginning. It's a hot topic, uh, lots of people working on it, uh, but John showed us that it's yet to fully deliver its potential. You know, only half of marketing directors think it's really fully effective. Um, we've seen the importance of making sure purpose is linked to product not forgetting that important linkage. Uh, we then, uh, John took us through uh, the uh, sustainability spectrum. I think one sort of misunderstanding to try and clear up today, you don't have to be an activist brand in order to have brand purpose, you know, as part of what you're doing. You shouldn't leave this, you know, feeling obliged. You have to be like a Ben and Jerry's or a Patagonia. John showed you some different ways that you can either have it as a, you know, a lead role or as a support role. Um, and then this important uh, thing that John's talked us through about, you know, making sure that you're, you're driving it through the whole business. Uh, so not just through um, communi communication. And I want to pick up on that, uh, on this theme of story doing and storytelling that, that John introduced earlier on with, uh, with, ben and, with Ben and Jerry's. Now, one of the most high profile campaigns of recent times that was showcased as an example of brand purpose is the Gillette campaign uh, against toxic masculinity. Uh, a lot of things have happened since this campaign. You, you may have forgotten about it. We've written, we wrote a series of blogs about it, but they went out with a very, very high profile campaign in 2019, very, di completely different from anything we've seen from Gillette before that had been a very product focused brand. Uh, there's this film here. You can see the film on the, on the, on the blog. It talks, it shows men behaving badly, it shows boys fighting, it shows all the sort of the bad side of masculinity and it urges men to be better, which is, you know, an incredibly important topic and, a, and a, a, you know, a, a important topic to tackle. Um, it did create uh, a massive backlash. So that's one of the things you have to be ready for if you're going down this sort of activist route is be ready for the backlash because it will be severe. You're going to and you know, delight some people, you're gonna really piss off some other people, so be ready, be ready for that. Now, from a standpoint of generating noise through storytelling, this campaign was very effective. So you look at the stats that were shared by the brand team, the number one trending topic on Twitter, 110 million global views, and 77% of those all important millennials were positive. About this campaign so you cannot argue from a short-term storytelling standpoint this blew the doors off the, the the question that intrigued me and i did ask this to the ceo of gillette uh, when i met him at a conference was what about the substance behind i'm sorry this is the the backlash sorry i backlash i was talking about here sorry before i go to the ceo uh you know i'm taking action uh uh, I, I'm never buying any product from Procter & Gamble again until everyone involved is fired from top to bottom and the company issue a public apology. So if you go down the activist route, you know, buckle up, uh, you know, put on your protective gear and be ready for the, ready for the backlash because it, be, uh, it will be severe. Uh, so back to, the, uh, back to the CEO challenge. Uh, the, the question was, what about the story doing? You know, what, what about the action, the substance that's backing this up? And, Gillette was supporting, a, you know, good causes. So for eligible non-profits, helping men of all ages achieve their personal best, 
which is a slightly wide definition, uh, you can apply for funding. And they donated the royal sum of $1 million, which is not to be sniffed at. It's a, you know, it's a big amount of money in absolute terms, but this is a $6 billion brand. So they're donating 0.02% of their revenue in terms of action to back it up. So it feels a little bit like it's about comms and storytelling, not a lot of story doing. And when you look at the Google Trends results and look at the sort of you know, amount of search going on for Gillette, you can see this was a short-term spike. It spiked around the time of that campaign. I think it's around over a good half of this was negative, you know, incredibly bad feedback and half positive, but they got a lot of noise, but it was short-term. Look at the Google search trends, campaign finishes, bang, it collapses. So this is short-term storytelling that has limited impact. You're going to be famous for a quarter. You're going to get your name in the marketing press. But what about long-term effect? Contrast that with Patagonia, a brand that John mentioned earlier. So this is a brand committed to story doing, not just storytelling. There's a whole series of initiatives. Uh, re you know, reducing the amount of products you need to buy by just making really good quality products that last. First thing they do, they will repair your Patagonia gear. They'll repair it so it lives for longer. They'll help you find a new home for your Patagonia gear. They're actually going to facilitate the process of selling your gear on. And then they're very committed to recycling the gear that is worn out so it can have a second life. So this is story doing, not just storytelling. And contrast the Google search trends for Patagonia, you can see here, A, it's higher than Gillette's by quite a significant margin, and B, it's sustained. So this is a sustained level of high search being generated over time. The peaks, in case you're curious, are Christmas. So even though this is a social mission-led brand, ultimately it comes down to selling more stuff. We want a nice peak at Christmas when people are offering these jackets as Christmas presents, and that's what we see. So this is real story doing as a complement to storytelling. And it's the way that we suggest brands should be working towards in terms of delivering the people and planet aspect of their, of their brand purpose. Let's finish off by looking at the fifth workout. We're ending with what's the most important, I suggest, of all the workouts today, which is building your purpose on deep insight. Back to the research John shared earlier, he showed us how delivering across the whole business was number one. Close behind and number two is building on deep insight. And we can use Lego uh, as an example of this, using a tool that we use on our brand gym projects. And we also talk about a lot on the brand growth program, which is the triangle of truth. We look at three truths, cultural, human, and brand truth. So using the Lego example that John uh, talked about earlier, picking back up on that, the cultural truth is looking at the broader, bigger picture perspective at the societal level. And here we see a concern around children's creative skills diminishing in a world dominated by digital technology. So maybe spending too much time looking at screens. The human truth brings it down to a much more personal level. So we're going from societal level down to the personal level and almost like one to one. And here talking to parents, they say, I want playful ways for my kids to learn about being creative. So they don't want to lecture them, you know, they want it to be fun, playful, but they do want them to learn to be creative. And then the really important third truth, which sometimes gets forgotten, when brands go off track with their brand purpose work is tie it back into your brand truth. What's the substance you've got that can be used to tap into the cultural and human truth to deliver something relevant? And here we see the Lego building system of colorful bricks augmented by digital technology that John talked about earlier. We've got robotics, we've got those Super Mario uh, figures that actually look like a video game with video game functionality. Uh, really smart ways of complementing the bricks with, with technology and then the purpose that, Brand, uh, that uh, John highlighted earlier to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. And the summary sort of rallying call that sums it all up is keep building, which I think is, is, is lovely, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, it's really talking about this idea of building in all its, all its, uh, all its different uh, dimensions. 
So that brings us to uh, those, the final uh, section to just do a little bit of a, a summary of those workouts. So let's do a quick recap. Um, we started off by urging you to root your brand purpose work in product. We saw how marketing directors believe product is important as an element of uh, brand purpose in addition to sustainability. We saw that consumers, in fact, were even more keen on that. We saw that actually half of consumers today uh, are saying that product, you know, is the key reason. Now that is going to evolve over time. So the message here is that, you know, sustainability is important, but, but don't forget your product and try and link those two um, together, as we saw with the Hellman's example. Even their sustainability is linked to their core product. The Heinz example John showed you, the same thing applies because Magic Breakfast is actually driving huge trial of Heinz baked beans to hundreds of thousands of people. And the Lifebuoy example is actually, it's delivering SMS, selling more soap by getting the Lifebuoy product into the hands of hundreds of thousands or millions of potential future consumers. John also recommended that you pick your place on the sustainability spectrum. Don't feel obliged to be an activist brand. It is one route, it is only one route, um, and maybe only for a handful of brands that have the commitment and stamina to really follow it through with story doing over the long term. Drive your purpose through the whole business. John showed you the Lego example about that. How can you bake your purpose into your hiring? How can you have gestures and rituals within the business that bring it to life? How can you deliver it through your stakeholders? Deliver it across the whole business. Don't just do storytelling, which is a short term idea. As you drive it through the business, use story doing as well. What are the bold actions that you're going to use to back up your communication? And then we finished off with the uh, Lego example uh, with the triangle of truth to guide you through a process of looking culturally at a high level, human truth at a personal level, and back that up with your, uh, with your brand truth. If you are interested in uh, applying the, the brand, uh, these brand uh, purpose workouts, of course, we're, we're here to uh, help um, or offer advice if you've got any questions. Uh, it's, a, it's at the heart of our sort of approach to projects that we've done for a whole range of clients, as we said, from Unilever to LVMH to uh, insurance, everything from beer to banking and biscuits and everything in between. And uh, it's a central part of the brand growth program, which kicks off in three weeks time. The program combines on-demand content, live workshops, and, and a chance to actually apply these workouts, including brand purpose, to your, uh, to your own brand and come out with a 30-tool toolkit at the end. And here's the exclusive offer I promised you. Uh, almost everybody, apart from a hand, couple of people, are, are still here, so that's great. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, join the program, uh, there's a 10% off code for the a limited period only, webinar 10. So when you buy the program, type in that, you get 10% off. That will end up with the price of a program which I calculated, if you do it over 365 days, is cheaper than the cost of a Starbucks cappuccino every day. So if you have a cappuccino every day, stop drinking coffee, <laughs> and you can use that to, to get yourself a place on the Brand Growth Programme, and it works out, uh, it works out about the same as a, as a Starbucks coffee a day. Surely, surely you're worth that as, as marketeers. You've got to invest in your own personal brand. Um, and if you want to get in touch, uh, it's David at the Brand Gym, David N at the Brand Gym, and John at the Brand Gym if you want to get in touch with us after today. But hopefully we've got some, uh, we've got some questions uh, rolling in that uh, David N um, is going to uh, take us through. So we're going to have the three of us uh, on screen hopefully at the same time, and uh, David is going to take us through some of the, uh, the questions uh, that we've had coming in so far. Very good. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, David and John. Yes, we've got a, a bunch of questions, and um, I yes, well, let, let's go through that. There's one that's come up in in, in a couple of places actually. Uh, we had some emailed in before, but it's also come up uh, here, which I will put to. Um, I'll start with 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 you, David, on this one. Uh, what's the difference between brand purpose? And brand positioning is it just the same old same old with a new name yes so this is this is one where people really get in a mess uh mixing up purpose and it's not helped by the media who just mix these terms up brand purpose as we define it and use it on projects is 
is the higher order driving force behind your brand like why do we why do we exist so in the case of lego you know it's built creating the builds of tomorrow it's that higher order thing the the thing that's driving you to climb up the mountain you know and get to the top um beyond just purely making money brand positioning is complementary and is we would a more complete like a toolkit which captures things like yes but what's the product proposition behind that what's my brand personality you know what are the reasons to believe that back up the, the benefits that i deliver as a brand who's my target consumer so it's a more complete rounded set of tools which work a bit like a navigation system for a car a bit like a gps system or a gps system that helps you climb the mountain and navigate your route up the mountain and make sure that you're staying on track towards this ultimate you know purpose that's driving me driving me forward so the two are not interchangeable. I know some commentators say don't bother with brand purpose or don't bother with brand positioning. We would certainly recommend that they have complementary roles that, uh, that work together. Great. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll move straight on to, to another one. Uh, uh, for, for John, this one's for you. So uh, imagine a large company uh, buys a small activist brand with a very strong kind of purpose how how, how, do, how does that get handled yeah thanks david i think um actually ben and jerry's is a good example of that so when unilever bought ben and jerry's whenever that was 20 odd years ago um it kind of messed it up pretty quickly by trying to pull it into the main kind of mothership um you know so harmonizing um, the procurement of key ingredients and putting all the marketeers onto the same training program as all the other unilever marketeers and all mm. that kind of stuff and, and, it, and, it, and it really didn't work at all. Um, there's a whole book written about it called The Ice Cream War, actually. Um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it really didn't work. And actually what they learned was to treat or, or for, for, to, to give you know, um, Ben & Jerry's the license to operate quite independently. Um, and actually when you look at Ben & Jerry's, I mean, it does some stuff that the rest of Unilever kind of looks at and think, oh my God, why are they doing that? So it had a big campaign against um, uh, GMO for um, genetically modified ingredients at a time when other Unilever brands were still using them. And um, very recently, it was in the news for boycotting um, Israel when, you know, Israel is a big business for the rest of Unilever. But, you know, it works. And I think giving them that degree of independence really works. So uh, over the recent years, when Unilever has bought purpose-based brands like um, Ren, um, Skincare would be a good example, or Pucker, you know, the, the, the tea brand. It's given those brands a really high degree of independence. It's kept the founders around for a long time. It's maintained that kind of founder's spirit. Um, and it's been very, very careful not to pull it in too closely to the kind of main uh, corporate uh, Unilever brand. So I think those are all good tips for anyone that finds them either side of that equation, whether you're acquired by a big company or, when, or whether you're working for a big company that acquires a, a smaller, more purpose-driven uh, brand. Am I understanding, John, if you can maybe uh, share some insight from your, your time as VP of marketing at uh, Unilever? Um, my understanding is that when, if, you, if you see the people working on the brands, you know, they followed through that with the hiring internally. So you would know if you were looking at the Lynx Axe brand was always an example. Like, you know, you had to, it was this thing about taking the red pill or the blue pill, like the Matrix movie to work on the brand. Maybe Ben and Jerry's, you know, they're hiring people who are really interested in the in the issue, in the causes that the brand is championing. Did you did you see that sort of firsthand when you were yeah. at Unilever that it was followed through from a staffing standpoint? Definitely, definitely. The, the, yeah. the, and the casting of, of of people, I think, is really really important. So that there is some movement between people that have worked, you know, for a long time in the main Unilever business and and people that are, mm. are working on brands like um, Unilever. But those decisions are made really really um, carefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's really following through, as, as you highlighted on the Lego example, the challenge is not just doing your, you know, your comms campaign and a bit of promotion. It's really driving it through the, the, the business and being really serious about it from a hiring, staffing, training standpoint as, as well. Yeah. Great. Um, I've got a question uh, for you, DT, um, from Malcolm Het. Um, so he says, you're using sustainability and social mission a bit interchangeably. <laughs> Um, do, you know, do we have a point of view? Is one yeah. better than the other? What's what's the thanks, what's the thanks, view? Malcolm? You've you've hit a hot button. <laughs> uh, the way that we've tried to clarify that, and we've had some internal discussion and debate on this ourselves. Uh, to be to be to be honest, is 
is this idea of people and planet. So sustainability with those two subtitles. The social mission side, probably we would put under the, the people part of that. So it's helping the people, you know, that's the sort of more what I, I used to call social mission. So the Heinz example, you know, in terms of Magic Breakfast would, would fall into that category. Uh, the uh, example uh, that we talked about, Le Lego doing play days for, for kids in need, you know, kids from difficult back backgrounds who don't have the chance to play. That, that, would, that, would, that would fall under the people, whereas the stuff that Helmut is doing, for example, in terms of reducing food waste would fall under the planet side. So people, social mission would be the people um, side of sustainability and then the planet would be the more environmental sustainability um, side of it. And those two things together is what we would say adds up to, uh, we like the P's because people and planet and profit and purpose, you know, very important that everything has the same first letter. So that's, that's it. So thanks, Malcolm. Great, great, great question. There's also, I mean, just, if I can just chip, I mean, real power when those two things come together. I, I just yeah. saw an example from uh, Walker's uh, crisps um, um, quite recently, who I, I, I stay very close to what they're kind of doing. Um, and they, they have this great um, activity at the moment where they um, collect, you know, um, old bags of, of crisps and they're converting them into, you know, footballs and right. um, football courts, you know, with like um, 3G turf and, you know, fencing around them. In you know pretty deprived areas of the of the country, and I just thought that was, I don't know, it just all fits together, doesn't it? And you kind of look at them doing that, and you kind of you get it on on so many different angles. Yeah, yeah. So you're actually delivering a social benefit on the people side, is what you're saying, but you're also doing something on the planet side by also recycling uh, plastic plastic bags and stopping those ending up in the uh, in the ocean or in landfill. And, yeah, and nice. incentivizing people you know, to, to reuse their bags kind of responsibly. Yeah, nice. Just yeah. nice. Um, I've, got, I've got a question um, from Will McKinley. Um, do we have any good examples of service companies, uh, you know, using their brand purpose uh, effectively? Any from a service company perspective, obviously we've been talking product brands. Um, can we, can either of you talk to service brands? Sure, I mean, I, I would, I, I think that service brands you know, are, are, are probably the ones that are most active because they're often corporate brands. So I think if you look at ITV, uh, which is a, a brand we, you know, we've been working with, um, you know, their, their Get Britain Talking, uh, Brit oh, sorry, Britain Get Talking campaign, uh, which was really interesting, which was during lockdown, it was all about actually encouraging people to talk. The great thing is that's linked to TV. There is a real direct link because TV is one of the most popular things that people chat about. So it's really tied into the core product. Um, and they, you know, impacted hundreds of thousands of people. They actually took the bold decision to bake that into their core product by actually pausing Britain's Got Talent live. You know, they paused the live show in front of, you know, having a million of people and actually talked about the importance of talking to one another, uh, you know, in order to, for mental health. So. I think that's the, that's uh, that's one example. I think uh, you know the schools initiative at Sainsbury's, a very long running campaign. You know, computers for schools, sports kit for schools. Another example. Um, um, you know, so, yeah. So yeah, as a as a support, that there's a good example of a supporter on our spectrum. Yeah, isn't it, yeah. So that would be probably supporting. That's right. So you know, it's not the fact that you know they wouldn't be an activist brand. They probably wouldn't even be a leading in terms of the role, but. Uh, but you know they uh, they certainly have it as a as a key support to what they're doing. Uh, so great great question. Thanks for asking that. Do recognise uh, you know the, we've used a lot of product brands uh, in the session today, uh, but absolutely applies to um, to service brands as well. Uh, in the email that goes out after the webinar, we'll add a couple of links to some blog posts for related to service brands, maybe just to yep. even things up a bit, because it's true that today was a bit product product focused. Uh, actually, actually, another question, uh, David, on, on um, business to business brands, which is, you know, similar, but a little bit different. And again, just an example that you can Google is a, a business I work with quite closely recently called um, Recycling Technologies. Um, amazing company. I mean, they, they basically um, uh, chemically recycle um, plas um, plastic, any type of plastic, black plastic, you know, anything. Um, and it creates little kind of pellets at the end of the of the process, and then those pellets are used to make plastic, you know, high quality plastics. And and their purpose, the, the reason that they exist, 
um, is to be the kind of the leaders in creating a circular economy for, um, for all plastics. Um, and it's beautifully kind of laid out that, that purpose kind of driven story on their, on their website. And that's very much business to business. You know, they're trying to convince plastic manufacturers around the world to use their product as the main um, you know, input as opposed to um, oil. Um, and they're also trying to convince uh, packaging manufacturers to, to, to use plastic that's, that's made through their process. So um, that's just a nice business to business example. Excellent. Great. Um, I had a question. Uh, I don't know if any three of us can have a go, go at this, which is where does brand purpose rank in consumer decision hierarchy? So we heard at the beginning of the talk how, you know, for millennials, it's a very important part of the process. But is it is it first? Is it second? Where in that funnel, that decision hierarchy, does it sit, do we think? Uh, I think it's climbing quickly up the charts. So, uh -huh. um, David Nichols, you know, you'll be familiar with this. I mean, we've been working with a company in the States called Smuckers, Indeed. particularly on their pet food business for about three years now. And we've we've been pushing really hard for um, innovation concepts that have some level of sustainability kind of baked into, into them. And I would say three years ago, in, in, in a, with a mainstream audience in kind of middle America, I mean, those concepts bombed. I mean, seriously kind of bombed. But actually, over that three year period, the, the, the consumer response is getting warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer and really starting to get quite hot now. Not quite to the point where if you didn't have a sustainability kind of element within the idea, it wouldn't work, but not that far away. So I think the days of saying, well, the consumer doesn't really care are, are really long gone, uh, particularly if you're targeting also obviously a, a kind of a younger um, consumer. But I think that it's a good question because it really prompts us to be clear here. The question is not, is sustainability important? The question is brand purpose important? And I would argue that brand purpose has always been important. The brands that do best tend to do more than just clean your hair, right? Head and shoulders gives you confidence. You know, it always has done. You know, I wouldn't have a speck of, you know, a speck of dandruff as, you know, I'd rather, I wouldn't have a spot on my tie. I wouldn't have a speck of dandruff on my shirt. I've doing that for year, for decades. They've been delivering confidence, which makes life better and goes beyond the pure product. So brands, are, the best brands have always been purposeful. So brand purpose, I would argue, has always been at the top of the agenda for successful brands with long term success. I think what the question often means is we mix up sustainability and brand purpose. So brand purpose has always been important. If we look within purpose at the sustainability aspect, then that has grown in importance. We see in our, our research suggests that from a consumer standpoint, 90 percent believe that it has, uh, not 9%, sorry, about, about was it a 60, 70% believe that it has some role to play. Only 10% say it's the main reason they buy, which is one in 10. You could argue that's actually quite a big number who say that's the main reason I'm buying. That's probably an, a, a niche audience at the moment. But then we saw a, a further, was it 50, 40, 50% um, who said that product and sustainability are important. And that's what I would say for most brands, that's the sweet spot. The sweet spot is link your product and your people planet to, together in this beautiful mix um, and don't lose sight of the, of, of, the, of the product. So the Heinz example, you know, their, their, sustain, their sort of social people based a, a angle on sustainability um, is about driving consumption of baked beans, right? Their products baked into that. They're driving penetration, which is how brands grow. They're celebrating their product, but they're also solving a problem, which is one in five kids risk going to school without a breakfast. So uh, I think the, uh, the question of, of, often is, is, you know, is, is, is not is brand, but brand purpose has always been important. The sustainability aspect of delivering your brand purpose has, gr has grown, as John, uh, as, as John uh, highlighted. Uh, got an interesting question. We, we, we're sort of debate storytelling and story doing. There was a question here from uh, Phil Reinerson. Uh, for brands trying to do story doing uh, the, the, the right way, is it ever advisable to run uh, an earned media campaign uh, that's, that's uh, basically that's just pure PR around an issue rather than to be seen to be just kind of um, leveraging it for sales? to be kind of, you know, selling more stuff too obviously around an issue. How, how do we balance that? Do we, do we have a view on that? I'm not a big, I must have say, I, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't be a great fan of people just trumpeting a, trumpeting a cause 
you know, to raise awareness of the issue without backing it up. I mean, I said That's to the it. CEO of Gillette, I mean, really 0.02%, is that it in terms of really, you know, innocent smoothies, is it, is it you know, you know 10% of profit or, you know, it, it, you know, innocent smoothies, you know, back it up. Uh, you know, the likes of Patagonia are actually doing their, putting their money where their mouth is, you know, they're talking about recycling their clothes. So going out and trumpeting an issue, which is, is really, that's my issue with, my issue with Gillette wasn't the fact that they were raising awareness of an important issue. It's that it, it was a short term because you don't see a lot of that anymore. You know, they went out and spent paid media to raise awareness of the issue, which was applauded. But, but where, where's it gone? Yeah. Well, what happened since? I mean, I haven't seen a lot since then. They're back to selling razors. Um, so in a way, it almost could breed cynicism because people say, well, that was just, it was just, you know, just like the comms trying to sort of, you know, be, be, be in the moment. Whereas the brands like the Patagonias, you know, that, that Heinz example is a five year commitment, you know, to, 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 you know, to sort of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of meals. Uh, you know, it's a long term story doing and storytelling campaign and that's but, certainly... but within the campaign there could well be earned media pure pr as part of and a whole activation chapter that includes other things but it's backed um, up they can back it up they're not just going out and raising awareness of the exactly which is what there. which is kind of what we were expecting when we saw the gillette kind of pr and tv break we think right you know walk into the store where's the where's the product side of this which it, it just didn't happen yeah um uh, are we ready for a big one? Give it to John. Go <laughs> <laughs> on. All right, this is from Gav Thompson. Oh, I've read this. Oh, one. Gav, hello, Gav. You've, you've read this one. From Mr. Ritson, Mark Ritson, and Byron Sharp, who rarely agree on anything, both agree that brand purpose is moronic, bollocks, and bullshit. It's because they haven't, they've completely misunderstood. I know both Byron and Mark, they've completely misunderstood what brand purpose is. They're, they're mixed up. They're mixing up brand purpose and sustainability. Yeah. And they're talking about exam. Mark talks about, yeah, look at this. You know, Google's got this brand purpose. And yeah, you know, they're doing this stuff, which is dodgy in terms of privacy. He's mixing up uh, brand purpose and sustainability, which is the whole thing we're trying to show, say today. You know, it's people, people and planet, products and profit. And, uh, you know, if, if you don't believe that, you know, combining product and sustainability as part of delivering a bigger idea to drive profit, is moronic, then sign up to the Branding Academy. Don't sign up to the mini marketing MBA you'll learn, you'll, you'll, to really learn about, you know, run purpose. Mark won't mind me. His program's much bigger, but you know, yeah, no, they're mixing up brand purpose and sustainability, which is they're falling into the trap that a lot of people are, are, are doing today. Um, and that leads people to forget the product. It leads you down that Estrella Dam, you know, route we saw earlier on. We've got pictures of people dancing under the ocean, you know, with plastic bags and you're thinking, well, what? You know, you, 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 those, those ads that you sit there and, and go, what? Sorry? What, what? You know, why is that brand trumpeting that issue? Whereas the Corona I mean, example... Is, sorry, go on, John. I, I mean, there is a lot of stuff around. Where I think they quite rightly kind of jump on it. Um, I saw actually Byron Sharp tweeted um, this morning. So the, the, there was that thing in the paper or the marketing press about... Um, Heinz changing their kind of logo from, you know, um, what Beans is it? means Heinz. Beans means Heinz to Beans means more, I think. Yeah. And I think uh, Byron tweeted uh, something along the lines, is this some kind of spoof, you know? And obviously it goes against his whole thinking around distinctive brand assets and kind of undermining yeah. you know, what immediately people associate with the brands like Heinz. He's, I, a, I, he's, a, he's a purist uh, extremist proponent of his scientific rules. Whereas if you looked at the bigger picture of the keystone, the colors, the, 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 you know, the beans, the beans, the means, you know, there's a huge amount of consistency. They've added in some freshness, you know, for a short term campaign. So I think it's actually adding a twist. Now it doesn't fit in his rule book, uh, you know, and Byron, you know, he's a, he, he, he's a, he's a extremist proponent of his scientific rules and if, you know, don't break them. So, uh, you know, a lot of Byron shots baked into the way that we work, but then we we had a bit of a twist, and I, I think that yep. that's uh, yeah. We've okay, we've got we, one more, have we? We've got what time for one specific um, one? Uh, sustainability. Here's here's a here's a thought. Sustainability is now. Uh, I'm reading off the chat. Uh, a price of entry in premium clothing, so no longer differentiating. Um, so it, it, you know, so how do you do a purpose that does differentiate? Well, remember the brand purpose isn't just about sustainability. Exactly. So what's your bigger idea? 
if you, if you if the if the if the person who asked the question is saying sustainability is the price of entry and some some level of it is uh, you know some level of it, of it is that's the stuff that often happens at that corporate level in this in John's suspect spectrum he showed you know you just have to be doing this stuff right to be to be just to be well to get up and go to work in the morning and feel good about yourself as a, as a, as a leader we have you know you have to take action and and then as a price of entry so the question then is well but why do you exit? What's your purpose beyond just sustainability? And that will help you figure out how to deliver the sustainability in a distinctive way. Yeah. So Corona, we didn't have time. I took it out, but it's on the blog. Uh, you know, cleaning up the beach. Absolutely bloody brilliant. The brand's about the beach. It's about that world. And if the beach is full of plastic, it screws up delivering the Corona, you know, imaginary universe. Therefore, buy a four pack of beer will clean a meter of beach. So you can go out and drink Corona all night and have a fantastic evening. And when people say, what are you doing? Why did you come home like that last night? You can say, oh, saving the planet because you're cleaning the beach by drinking beer. So their purpose about live on the beach is clear. So that beach lifestyle and therefore it allows them to create a sustainability platform that is distinctive and linked back to the product and helps sell more stuff. So look at the bigger idea which can encompass people, planet and product. And that will help you, A, drive product initiatives that grow the core business. And it will also help you figure out how to deliver sustainability in a distinctive way, like the Lego example. Builders of tomorrow, let's go out and help kids build in order to be creative. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we need to... You could to... go on. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. You could go on we all day. We need to bring this to a close because I'm sure people have got... nine more questions we haven't answered. Oh, dear. They've we'll got loads that. more Zoom to do, but uh, we will, thank uh, you. We will answer the questions. We'll have a look at the Q&A, and if there are any that we haven't answered, we can, um, we'll maybe answer them on the blog or in some other way because we, yep. we don't want to lose those. Very good. So it just remains for me to say thank you to everyone for joining. Really, really great that you, you came and joined us. Um, uh, as David said, there'll be an email come, going out with a link to a recording of this if you want to share it or relive any of the issues. Um, so uh, it's now a clock. So thank you and goodbye from the brand, Jim. Bye, everybody. Thanks very much.